Savior Jesus Christ. I want to welcome you to this service for First Presbyterian Church here in Pilot Mountain this Sunday, March 26, 2023. A few announcements that need to be made. We do have uh, pilot outreach needs for April, which are canned chicken, beef stew, and chili. Those can always be made up here at the basket uh, for pilot outreach. Uh, here at front. And our blessing box over on Needham Street is always in need of filling. It can be filled directly or in the closet uh, behind the choir. The latest these days devotions are uh, available at the entranceway there or over here off to my left. And we do have a community music evening uh, coming up this Tuesday on the 28th at 6 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, also, uh, Thursday, April 6th is our Monday Thursday service coming up. Uh, we'll be at 7 p.m. here in the sanctuary. And Easter is coming up <coughs> over two weeks from now. Can you believe that? April 9th, there is this Easter sunrise service at 7 o'clock uh, on Pilot Mountain at the, uh, at the State Park. Uh, beginning again at 7 o'clock, sunrise is at 6.57. Uh, we'll be meeting with the United Methodist Church as well as the First Baptist Church, as well as any other churches that want to be uh, part of this uh, service. As for uh, other announcements, there is a men's breakfast on the uh, 16th of April. Note that uh, that is a different time. Usually it's the second Sunday, but the second Sunday is going to be uh, Easter Sunday. And on, also on the 16th, there's selections, uh, the Easter portion of the Messiah, uh, Oratorio by Handel will be at 1.30, <clears throat> excuse me, 1.30 here in the sanctuary uh, with Trinity Episcopal Choir in that area uh, presenting that. At this time, let us worship God. Sunday of the month, and at this time, we do come around and take up for our two cents meal offering to help those in hunger in our presbytery as well as in our nation.
loving God for those who have given. We give you thanks. We give you thanks for those who are constantly, always, and ready to give to those who are less fortunate. Grant this gift that it may help those who are in need, that we may be a part of that, and that we may be a part of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. Join me in our call to worship. O mortal, can these bones live? O people, hope in the Lord. Let us join together with our hymn of praise, number 610. tells us if we say that we have no sin, we are found to be lying and God is not with us. The scripture also tells us if we confess our sins, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let us now, standing in body or in spirit, confess our sins to both God and to each other in our unison and prayer of confession. dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. If Jesus Christ dwells in you, the Spirit of God will be you with your life, and the grace of God will be your righteousness. And if the Holy Spirit dwells in you, 
And God, who raised Jesus from the dead, will also give you life to your mortal bodies. Friends, this is the good news of the gospel. <clears throat> In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God.
used for the glory of your kingdom here on earth. May they be used to glorify your name and your name only. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Now to the prayers of the people, I ask that you turn to page six of your bulletin, look over those prayer requests from our congregation, as well as those of our family and friends in our community. And are there any that need to be added at this time? Yes, um, Dina Goyne. Dina Goyne. Goyne. If there are no others, let us turn our hearts and our minds to God in prayer. Out of the depths we cry to you, O Lord. Lord, hear our voices and be attentive to our prayer. We pray for those whose hope is lost, who feel dried up and cut off from you. By your grace, open their graves, bring them back to the land of the living. We pray for those who are oppressed, whether that be in political oppression, in any kind of oppression, who feel kept or captive by the power of death. We ask that you release them from their chains, unbind them, and let them go. We pray, we pray for those who weep, loss and lifeless and fear and regret. Grant them the peace of your presence. Show them what your love can do. We pray for those who are dying, the light of life fading in their eyes. Help them to believe in you so that they may live and never die. And we thank you, O oh Lord, for having heard our prayers. Enable us to trust in you and thus to see your glory. It's through Jesus Christ, the resurrection and the life that we pray, the one who taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And let us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Please join me at this time for our prayer of illumination. Friend of your bulletins. O oh Lord, we wait for you, and in your word we trust. By the power of your spirit, set our hearts and minds on the source of life and peace. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Our first reading this morning comes from John chapter 11. Verses 17 through 44. When Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb four days. Now Bethany was near Jerusalem, some two miles away, 
And many of the Jews had come to Martha and Mary to console them about their brothers. <coughs> when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went and met him while Mary stayed at home. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, Yes, Lord, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, the one coming into the world. When she had said this, she went back and called her sister, Mary, and told her privately, The teacher is here and is calling for you. And when she heard it, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet come to the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. The Jews who were in the house consoling Mary saw Mary get up quickly and go out. They followed her because they thought she was going to the tomb to weep there. When Mary came where Jesus was and saw him, she knelt at his feet and said to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping and the Jews who came with her also weeping, he was greatly disturbed in spirit and deeply moved. He said, Where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus began to weep. So the Jews said, See how he loved him? But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Then Jesus again, greatly disturbed, came to the tomb. It was a cave, and a stone was lying against it. Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, already there is a stench because he has been dead four days. <coughs> Jesus said to her, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone, and Jesus looked upward and said, Father, I thank you for having heard me. I knew that you always were to hear me, but I have said this for the sake of the crowd standing here, so that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out! The dead man came out, his hands and feet bound with strips of cloth, and his face wrapped in a cloth. Jesus said to him, Unbind him, and let him go. Many of the Jews, therefore, had come with Mary and Martha, had seen what Jesus did and believed in him.
second reading is coming from the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. And I will be reading from Robert Alter's translation of the Tanakh, the Hebrew Scriptures. The hand of the Lord was upon me, and he took me out by the wind of the Lord, and he set me down in the valley, and it was filled with bones. And then he passed by them all around, and look, there were very many on the surface of the valley, and look, they were very dry. And he said to me, Man, can these bones live? And I said, O oh, Master, Lord, it is you who knows. And he said, Prophesy to these bones, and say to them, O oh, dry bones, listen to the word of the Lord. Thus says the Master, the Lord to the dry bones. I am about to bring breath into you, and you shall live. And I will lay sinews over you, and bring up flesh over you, and stretch over you skin. And I will put breath in you, and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. And I prophesied as I was charged. And there was a sound as I prophesied. And look, a clatter. And the bones came together, one bone to another. And I saw, and looked, upon them were sinews, and flesh came up, and skin stretched out over them from above, but there was no breath in them. And he said to me, Prophesy to the wind, prophesy, man, and say to the wind, Thus said the Master, the Lord, From the four winds come, wind, and blow into these slain, that they may live. And I prophesied as he had charged me, and the breath came into them, and they lived. And they stood up on their feet, a very, very, very great legion. And he said to me, Man, these bones are all the house of Israel. They say our bones are dry and our hope is lost. We have been cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus said the Master, the Lord, I am about to open your graves, and I will bring you up, my people, from your graves and bring you to Israel's soil. And you shall know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and when I bring you up from your graves of my people. And I will put my breath in you and you shall live and I will set you on your soil and you shall know that I am the Lord has spoken and have done it, said the Lord. These are the words of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Today we have a couple of very familiar, very interesting texts that we have read. Both speak of the power of God to bring new life into areas where death reigns and all hope seems to be gone. In Ezekiel we find a passage where dry bones are filling a valley. In John we hear the familiar story of the resurrection or resuscitation of Lazarus. Each of these stories bring comfort to those reading them as they are promises that Death is not final when God is involved, but also that new life is given by God. In Ezekiel, we find the prophet taken by God into a valley full of dry bones, scattered all over the plain. He is to walk around them, check them out, see what he sees. You see, bones that are very fresh or still have moisture in them, the marrow and the water is still there from life. On the other hand, dry bones, as Ezekiel saw, are bones that lay in the sun for a long, long time. They usually are bleached and there is no chance of any life being in them. And so it is with the bones in the valley where Ezekiel is taken. And when asked by God, can these bones live? The prophet's reply is cautious and guarded. He says, God, you know, an answer that is a non-answer. Basically, he, in the layman's terms of basketball, he puts the ball back in God's court. He knows what happens to dry bones, and he knows that there is no life in them. So he's puzzled by God's question. But God isn't puzzled at all. God tells Ezekiel to prophesy. To say the words that he has told, and when he does so, when he begins to speak the words, the bones begin to clatter. 
that begin to come together. Click clack, click clack, click clack. Imagine that sound, hearing it over and over and over, all across this valley. And as the bones are clacking together, sinews begin to form, and then flesh begins to cover, and then skin begins to cover. <coughs> The bones have become human once more. But there is no breath, no spirit, no life, no ruah in Hebrew. And then God says that the spirit is to be called upon, that the wind, he says, call to the wind, to the four winds, that breath will be coming into these dry bones. They will live once more because God will put the spirit on those in the valley, breathing life that only God can give to the slain, giving life where there was none. Ezekiel is told that the bones of the nations of Judah and the people of Israel who were taken into exile by the Babylonians. The nation and the people were as good as dead, lifeless as the dry bones in the valley. Yet when God has the Spirit breathe on them, they will come back to life and they will have a new life in the land from which they were taken. They will know that God did this and when God spoke and acted, life was always there. Fast forward a bit. We find Jesus and his disciples on the east side of the Jordan River where John baptized those who came to him. Jesus and company were running away from those who had wished to kill him because he had said before Abraham was, I am. And now they're resting and trying to figure out what the next move is. Well, at least the disciples are. While they are waiting, they receive news that their friend Lazarus is ill. Mary never told what the illness was, and nor was there a request for Jesus to move it along and come quickly, though that most likely was implied. But Jesus takes his time. He waits for two days before heading out to Bethany. And during that time, he tells the disciples that Lazarus is asleep. <clears throat> the disciples say Lazarus is going to be okay. Because as they know, when one is sick, that rest is best. But Jesus looks at them, kind of rolls his eyes at what he says, and then looks at them and says, Lazarus is dead. Jesus never mints his words. But he also says that he wishes this so that they may believe. And when they arrive at the village, Martha, the sister of Lazarus, runs out to meet Jesus, while Mary, the other sister, stays behind with the rest of the mourners. And Martha's words to Jesus are full of grief, resignation, some complaint, and some hope. She says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that God will give you whatever you ask of him. As we know, Jesus tells her that Lazarus will rise again. And Martha, like everyone else in the gospel, misses the emphasis of what Jesus is saying. She falls back on the teachings that she knows, that there will be a resurrection in the last day. But what good is that in the now? Lazarus is dead. What is Jesus going to do about it? But when Jesus next speaks, he speaks the most important words of the entire passage. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. Those who believe in me, even though they die, will live. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe? Martha proclaims that she believes that Jesus is the Messiah and goes and gets Mary who comes and says the same thing when she meets Jesus. And then an interesting thing occurs. The NRSV says that Jesus was deeply moved. But the Greek says that he was angry or indignant. With what was Jesus angry? Was it death and sin that caused the grief of his friend? <coughs> Was it the unbelief of those who were around that were there for the family? We do not know. But what we 
do know is that Jesus tells them to move the stone from the grave. And at this, Martha, wide-eyed and her mouth covered in horror, <coughs> states the obvious. There will be a stench. The King James says, it will stink us. I like that, stink us. There will be a stink. The body's been in there for four days, Jesus. It's going gonna, it's gonna to smell. Don't you know that? Why are they moving the, the rock away? Jesus is undeathered, and he tells her that if she had believed, then the glory of God will be revealed. And after a prayer of thanksgiving to the Father, Lazarus is called from the tomb, and everyone is watching. With their mouths open, and they're watching intently, they begin to hear a shuffling sound. Something's moving in there. What is it? And then there he is, Lazarus, still wrapped up on the day as he was buried. And Jesus tells those around him, go and help the man. Get those great claws off of him. Unwind him. Let him live a new life. There are many those who believed because of what they had seen and heard of that day. And there were those who soon after, for the determination for the good of the nation, delivered it, decided that Jesus must die. The cross is coming closer and closer to Jesus. The Ezekiel text is known to most people, if only in the song Dead Bones. The John text is very well known. And in both there is death and there is life. And in both it is God who brings about the new life. The dry bones are called to live by the words of God spoken to Ezekiel, who, though he may have had his doubts, believes that God will do what has been spoken. When he speaks the words, the bones come together, but there is still no life. And then the Spirit of God comes upon them, giving them life. It is a new life that God has given to the people who have lost all hope and believe that their lives will never be the same. In John, there is grief over the loss of a beloved friend and brother. And we know this passage because it's a common text used in many funerals. But what if there's more than just death in this passage? What if the text speaks about life in Christ as well as resurrection? Martha tells Jesus, or Jesus tells Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. This is the last I am statement that Jesus makes in the Gospel of John, a statement that proclaims his divinity to those who are listening. But there's something else going on here. I've read this passage many, many times. I've read it for funerals. I've read it in Bible studies. I've read it in personal studies. And I've missed a crucial point. I've often said that a word repeated needs to be paid attention to. There's something of significance in both texts for today. In John, the word believe occurs eight times between verses 15 and 45. That's a lot of time for a word to be said. It's not the noun belief, but the verb believe. It's active and moving. Jesus does not say that he wants those to have belief. But he wants them to believe, to be active in the belief that they have in him. He wants them to realize that he's not only capable of conquering death and bringing back a man who is dead, but that he can and will give new life to those who are living. In Ezekiel, the word spirit, wind, or breath, if you notice, those are used several times. Those are prevalent words in the text. But why is that so important? Why is that important at all? It's because the same word in Hebrew means all of those things. It's the word ruach. It means breath. It means wind. It means spirit. And it is used nine times in the text. Ruach is something that comes from God. 
It's the ruah of God that gives Adam life in Genesis 2. And it is the ruah at work in this passage of Scripture that gives breath to those dry bones in the valley. We're in the same place as many were in the Ezekiel passage. Our church is graying or is gray. Let's be honest. We see smaller and smaller attendance. We feel like Ezekiel that we are looking at a valley of dry bones in which there is no life. We say like Martha that we believe, but when we're told to move the stone, we make a comment about what we know will be behind there. We seldom believe that there is new life that comes from God. But God is still in control. God calls us to, like Ezekiel, prophesy, not to tell the future, but to proclaim the word of the Lord. We are called to go and tell those in the world about what we have, that they too can have it. And when we do so, there will be new life given. Sinews, flesh, and skin will return and the life-giving spirit will be given. Jesus asks us to believe, and in believing, to help those who were dead and brought back to life to take off their grave clothes and live a new life. Link gives us a time to reflect on the death, which is the ultimate equalizer of all. Leo Tolstoy's story of how much land does a man need. In the end, all he needed was six feet long and six feet deep. It is a great equalizer. But in reflecting on death, we are reminded that God will bring new life as we look toward Easter, which comes in only two weeks. Jesus says to us, like the vision in Ezekiel, these bones that you see of your life, of your church, they will live. Do you believe this? Amen. <clears throat> Our affirmation of faith this morning comes from the Heidelberg Catechism. It is question one of the catechism. And I ask that you stand in body or in spirit as we say what we believe. I will ask the question and answer with you at the same time. What is your only comfort in life and in death? The answer is that I am not my own, but belong in body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for my sins and his precious blood and has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me more heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. If you would please remain standing in body or in spirit as we sing our final hymn, number 728.
rise, dry bones, and live. Come out, Lazarus, and give glory to God. Now may the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the resurrection and the life, bless and keep you in this life and the life to come. Amen. 